Welcome to another edition of Camera Photo Talk podcast. I'm really excited about introducing my next guest. It's somebody who inspired me back in the day when I was starting photography in the commercial world as an editorial photographer. It wasn't just the news coverage he was covering. It was the way he took pictures, very dramatic. His use of composition, the way he engaged with the subject, the way he used design in his work. In my view, he was a true photojournalist of the time and his awards validate that. And today's guest, I'd like to welcome photojournalist, writer, educator, Roger Hutchings. Hi, Roger. Hi, Zach. Uh, nice to talk to you this morning. How are you doing? Thank you for coming on and talking to me. No, it's a pleasure. Um, what are you up to these days? Um, in terms of uh, actually going out and making pictures, not very much. Uh, I tend to spend most of my time working on my archive, digitising, revisiting you know over 40 years worth of work in its own way it seems a rather passive and sedentary thing but it's very exciting too discovering new pictures that were overlooked you know at the time when they were shot probably because you know one was working on an assignment which had a very specific brief and what in the course of producing those pictures to fulfill the brief I might come across something that just personally interested me and uh, photographed it, but it probably wouldn't have been uh, uh, identified, marked up, uh, red penciled then because, uh, you know, it was um, exterior to the client's requirements. You must have quite a vast archive. Majority of that must be black and white, is it? I've got two rooms full of negatives and contact sheets and print. Mainly black and white? Um, yeah, 90% black and white. Black and white takes up quite a considerable amount of space. Okay. Huge amount of space. Huge amount of space. We used to cull when we did colour shoots. I mean, obviously, we were working mostly in transparency back in the uh, yeah. 80s and 90s. You know, we'd do an A edit and a B edit. 40 pictures in an A edit would be a big one. And maybe 20 outtakes. And the rest of the images got thrown away. Um, something with hindsight, I think, was perhaps slightly unwise. Although, when shooting positive film then, we did a lot of bracketing because the precision and exposure uh, was so demanding just to get that right uh, degree of saturation. So a lot of things that you threw out were actually either under or overexposed. Yeah. Do you still have access to a dark room? Wild horses wouldn't drag me into a dark room today. <laughs> Do you not miss the smell of stop bar? No. <laughs> it's still on a lot of the contact sheets that I've got left over from the observer. That is that smell does linger, doesn't it? Well, the smell and and, and also the chemical the chemicals in it as well. I, I know after I've been handling old contact sheets that quite often, you know, my hands are I have to wash my hands and it's definitely quite an acrid thing that it's obviously that fixation process. You know, you know how news, newspapers work very fast. They, you know, they yeah they didn't wash every contact sheet like we would have done if we were working in our own labs. Yeah, you know, yeah. for half an hour in a in a tank, which you know, you might have. There's sort of a nostalgic smell though of the past, isn't it? <laughs> well, what are you scanning your work on? Well, this is interesting. For a long time, I've used a Nikon Cool Scan nine thousand, but. More recently, I've switched over to uh, copying my negs using a, a Nikon with a macro lens and a slide copier, which I find produces really satisfactory results, especially in black and white and positive. A little bit tricky when you're dealing with colour negative. How are you lighting that with a light box behind it? I light it with a thing called a light cube. It's a small, heavily... Uh, it's just it's kind of a small video light really, which you can uh, you've got nine different levels of illumination, and and you pump the light through a diffuser. You're not the first photographer I've heard do say that. I think Brian Harris does that as well. He's been talking about. It's just so much faster. I mean, and and Nikon scanners, they are very good scanners, as far as I can see. Other than the Hasselblad scanners, you know, they were the, they were the best you can get. How do you see the difference in quality from the, the cool scan to the camera? I don't see any discernible difference. Interesting. I mean, obviously, you know, the thing is with the cool scan, you can do medium format. Yeah. Which I, I don't do on the on the camera. Yeah. The 9000 was a medium format as well, wasn't it? Yeah, 6.6, six, 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 Yeah, I've got the 4000, which is just 35mm. And it's pretty good. It's still going, actually. It's... Well, yeah, 
I used to find that the Nikon software was pretty uh, tricky and, and inconsistent at times. Yeah. Um, so I've always been a bit of a fan of ViewScan and SilverScan. Roger, you're renowned for your war and your frontline work in the 90s. And as you're aware, we've got a, a major scenario going on in Russia and Ukraine at the minute. How do you feel when you're looking at that? Do you, are you getting an itch still in your system to sort of look at it? Um, no, not at all. I'm, I mean, back towards the end of the 90s, I was coming around to making a philosophical decision that I'd had enough photographing conflict and and. And, you know, other um, situations uh, of extremity which involve people's lives. And then in 99, a very close friend of mine was murdered at a Serb checkpoint in, when trying to drive into Kosovo. He was a journalist called Gabriel Gruner uh, from Stern magazine, with whom I'd worked a lot during the Bosnian War. And we had become very good friends. And at that point, I just felt I would I made the decision that okay I've done this for quite a long time I've had a pretty good run um, I've had a few narrow escapes like being blown up by a landmine in Sudan but I felt it was time to call it quits really um, no I although I watch the situation in Ukraine both with horror and fascination and hope and anxiety I don't have any desire to be there. I know one or two older photographers that I've, I've known are out there and one or two friends who are, who are journalists are there and, and, frankly, I worry about them. Do you think the journalists are safer now than what they were back then? No. I think over the years the idea that the journalist was a kind of independent, objective observer um, has changed and now... Certainly in, in, in the Balkan Wars, journalists were seen as propagandists um, for one side or the other, and they therefore became a target. And I think that's why in, in recent times you've seen an increasing uh, rise in the, in the number of journalists who've been either injured or killed uh, in, the most, you know, in, in conflicts over the last 20, 25 years. Bosnia was a pretty brutal place. When you come out of that, did it affect you, like in mental health wise? Well, it's difficult to say if it was just Bosnia. I mean, I, I I delved into a lot of extremity in the years before that, in other wars in Ethiopia and the Sudan, Sri Lanka, the first Gulf War. I think perhaps cumulatively, there are a lot of a lot of impressions and scars, kind of dislocation from normality which can be set in place in your mind and and today people or you know it's identified as post-traumatic stress disorder my guess is to an extent I felt I had a kind of post-traumatic stress disorder um, which was part of the, the healing process of uh, if healing is the right word to stop doing that kind of work and, and, and to move on to uh, photographing things which uh, were more life-enhancing, I would say. Although, look, you know, this is not to... Uh, I must underline the importance of this kind of work, the importance of this documentation, the importance of the history of doing these things, of there being a record, of there being witnesses, you know, particularly coming from, you know, trusted sources, you know, provenance which is known, recognised and, and ex accepted as not being any kind of fake news. So, you know, people who do it today, incredibly courageous, but the risks they run, it seems to me, are bigger than, than they have been perhaps ever before. Your upbringing was, in contrast, very different to what you decided to eventually do as a job which I know there was a route to getting to this calling to go out and cover news as it was happening, events. Did you ever reflect back and wonder, how the hell did I get into that? I had pretty conventional middle-class upbringing, I should think you would say. I'd always had a strong interest in photography. Uh, my grandfather was a businessman, but also an extremely keen 
I wouldn't say pioneer in photography, but um, an early adopter. He had his own darkroom, and we're talking about in the 1890s now. <laughs> an interesting story. He um, There's a picture of my grandmother, my maternal grandmother. My The grandfather I'm talking about was my paternal grandfather. That's a picture of her that he sold her for sixpence um, because he used to go up to people in the street in this town, Winchester, where I used to live, uh, or where the family came from, and, and you know, sell, sell prints, which was, you know, they were unusual things to have in those days. It's, it's a piece of serendipity that he photographed a woman who was the mother of the woman that my father married. Um, but anyway, going back to that, so I had this keen interest, had all his equipment um, in the loft at home, his large format cameras, his tripods, his old enlargers, his glass plates. Latterly, then he moved into shooting with 35mm and was an early, um, worked early, very early on in colour using, um, I think Kodachrome was 12 ASA when it first came out. That's quite a challenge. Um, so there was that connection there. So when I was 15, 16, I was taking a lot of, a lot of pictures. Um, but for one reason, and, and in fact, I joined uh, when I was 17, a thing called the Bureau of Freelance Photographers, which was effectively a kind of correspondence course in photography who used to send out a market newsletter about various uh, market opportunities for people. And as a consequence of that, I sold my first pictures when I was, where was I, about 18. I saw that they needed pictures of uh, a magazine called Heavy Horse, needed pictures of, of Shire horses, these heavy horses. So I went out to a country fair, took some pictures of a ploughing match, sent them off, having used my darkroom, which was in the attic, extremely hot. Uh, glazed them on some old bits of plate glass using, I don't know what it was, probably chalk and talcum powder to, to, to clean up the glass first of all, and received a nice letter which I still have saying thank you for the excellent pictures. Um, the sum of one guinea does not seem uh, a lot to such excellent work. So that was my first sale. but. It kind of stopped there. Social pressure, family pressure, the idea of how would you ever make a living as a photographer uh, kind of uh, was usurped by the fact that I went off to university, did a degree in estate management, and then became a chartered surveyor, uh, which I did uh, practice as until I was in my late 20s when I realised that I couldn't possibly do that for the rest of my life. And I decided to quit the job, applied to various art colleges, luckily received a place at uh, School of Documentary Photography in Newport. Went there with a lot of optimism, just hoped that I might be able to make it work as a vocation for me. What were you looking at then in terms of picture-wise? What, what were you trying to shoot? I was interested then. It was the, it was the Thatcher era. She'd just been elected in 79. And the 70s were a tough time, sort of economically and socially. And I, I, I kind of wanted to get an insight into myself and, and the essence of Britishness. I'd studied politics, sociology and economics at A-level. And when I was doing my degree, I'd done a project about housing conditions, which I'd used my sort of interest in photography to illustrate. I was just interested in, in finding out more about myself, about the politics of Britain, the sociology of Britain. I suppose, you know, everything I did was kind of, in a way, opposite to the, uh, the upbringing I had. I wanted to put myself into new situations, meet different people. Uh, so, you know, moving from a cosy Hampshire town to living in, in the dock area of Newport in South Wales was in itself uh, an extreme change. David Hearn was the lecturer there. At Newport. Well, David Hearn set up the school That's of right, yeah. in, in, in Newport. And you were influenced by Bresson, I presume, as well? Well, the thing is, um, I suppose when I started out in photography, it was quite sort of, would the word be, pictorialist, 
you know, interested in landscape, very traditional. But when I was 21, one of my cousins um, for my 21st birthday gave me the world of Henri Cartier-Bresson, which rather, it was a rev revelation to me. And I saw how photography could be used in a, in a repertage sense, you know, how it could actually, effectively what the documentary photographer became was a kind of, you know, an historian. And, and that's how I think very much about strong documentary photography. It is actually an historical document. So, you know, that, and that's where the coalition between Newport and that kind of perception that I got from uh, encountering this book really came together. One was encouraged in the practice of social documentary photography, and that suited my aims and, 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 and interests at that time. Having the influence of David Hearn must have been really profound because he was a really prolific photographer. And I think when he set the scale up, he he was still his name was resonating as well in the industry. And he must have had a big effect influence on you, did he? I think his biggest influence yeah. was to create the understanding and belief that you could do it if you really wanted to do it. And and the one thing that David always um, impressed on us was it was in it was important to be to photograph the things that you were very interested in or very passionate about and perhaps which you knew a lot about because in such a way if you understand and are somewhat uh, you know fascinated by your subject you will make better pictures because you understand the meaning of the things happening around you their significance and he, and he also fed the idea that you could become an expert on anything in a very short time. So that if you're going off to a country to photograph the coal miners of the Donbass, you know, do your research and you have a strong starting point when you arrive. But I would never subscribe to the idea that photography is objective. I think it's a very, um, very subjective uh, practice, in fact. Although I think one should always question oneself mm. about the statement that you're making. And, and That's right. You know, so not approaching anything with any kind of bias um, or trying to dispel any kind of bias before you start to work. It's deeper than just subject matter and perseverance to create work. And I noticed that in your work. I, I, I was always interested in the way you really grasped composition and you really grasp the, the interaction with people within the planes and the, and the thirds and the way you used the deepness of blacks and contrast. And I noticed in a lot of your work there's a sort of a theme and a vein of style which runs through it and i love the way you use people in different parts to connect to train you to move the, the viewer's eye around the um around the frame and i know that sounds obvious i i've always felt you were really deeply into composition whereas i think we all are but i i just thought you always seem to really work at it and we're very consistent at that i think i've always been quite obsessed by it. do you know what you can tell i've always thought you were obsessed with it and, and i mean that with pure respect you know well i i've always sought to bring together content and form so that i have this marriage of the meaning the information that the photograph is imparting but together with a kind of very strict disciplined precise way of arranging the elements within the picture hopefully making a more compelling image. It actually translates the point, uh, what I'm trying to say in the picture, more powerfully to any potential audience. And that's not easy. It goes deeper. When you're in a, a conflict zone, somebody's just lost a son and they're, they're upset, you've got to switch into that mode. Uh, I think uh, I think you do it. You've got to... Now, let me, let me think about this. There's no point being anywhere unless as a photographer particularly in a conflict zone if you can't produce the if you can't capture and record the essence of what you believe the situation to be the tragedy the inhumane the grief the aggression and, and i think you know through being preoccupied with this on a 24 7 basis really i mean i i would say that all of my time since I started photographing, even, you know, walking to the underground or swimming or something, you, you're actually framing and thinking about the relationship between shapes and parts and meanings and, and putting them into a frame. And in my case, that was a 35 millimeter frame most of the time. I always tried to frame, I don't like cropping pictures. 
you know, I know it's a bit of a cliche to say that, but I always tried to make my picture, you know, to the edges of the frame, to the edges of my negative. And that's, that's a challenge. And there are a lot of failures there. But sort of coming back to your, the, the question you asked, you need to be accepted by the people you're photographing in whatever situation, you know. If I'm sitting with a family in a cellar in Sarajevo and they're expecting, uh, uh, Svetlana is expecting a baby in, in a few weeks' time and they're trapped in the cellar and they have to walk one and a half, two kilometres to get water under sniper fire. They need to trust. You need to build up trust. You, but you also need to, not non-present, but to be uh, to fade into the background so that after a while people stop thinking about you. And then what you photograph is is a more natural situation of people enacting their daily lives, really, under the various circumstances. I'm not sure that I've explained that very well, really. But all the time you are actually using your experience, awareness of elements, changing elements, light changing, the body language changing, a person coming into the room, which can coalesce in, in, into uh, making a, a situation which, if you record it, can tell the, the story, can say what you want to say about the set of circumstances. You're seeing it before you put your eye to the camera, really, aren't you? No, I don't agree with that. I don't carry around a frame in my mind. Some photographers do. You'll see with some photographers that, that a person's always in one position, you know, something else is in the same sort of position, and you can recognise that style immediately, but I really fight against doing that. I think that, um, it, you know, it's something that Sarkovsky talks about in his book, The Photographer's Eye. I mean, I try not to do it. Let me put it like that. I'm not pre-visualising anything, um, and I know I'm not because when the arrangement of, of the subject matter starts to come together, you start to get excited, and that's because you're seeing something new. Do you think that deepness was ingrained early on with your family influence? I actually don't know the answer to that. I mean, we're all influenced by the experience we've had in life. We all carry a kind of... So you left university... What was next? Well, I left university and came to work and went to work in London for a firm of property managers, uh, which I did for a year or so. Um, and then I, at that time, I was starting to feel extremely frustrated by, you know, this the, the profession that I'd opted to go into. And um, I moved moved back to Hampshire, started working for a small organisation there, Hampshire County Council. Uh, as an estates manager, that became so frustrating because of the bureaucracy that I, I, I quit. I quit at the same time as I was applying for art schools, uh, and so the, those things kind of came together very fruitfully. Really, I didn't know how to make a living as a photographer, and to make a living as a photographer is important if you want to be a photographer because you have to work out some kind of way to pay the bills yeah. while still doing what it is that you love to do and you feel is important to do. And the good thing about Newport was it was run without any kind of real academic uh, content. There were no dissertations to write or theses or I'm trying to think of some of the things that we had to teach at university, which I, th I felt were extremely irrelevant to being a working photographer. It was, it was a course that was designed to make a working photographer and from day one, you were given an assignment called Man at Work, and you had to go out, approach strangers, photograph them in such a way that you clearly expressed the nature of the work they were doing and the person's personality, come back, process, make contact sheets in the same day, and show them for a crit. Now, we were so fortunate at that time. There were four full-time tutors at Newport. There were nine students in my year. We had visiting lecturers, Joseph Kudelka, Christel Perkins, um, Patrick Ward, I'm just trying to think, uh, Bill Jay, uh, an old uh, colleague and associate of David Hearns. So it was an incredibly privileged and intense education. I think it taught a very simple form of communication. What is it I want to say and what's the best way of saying it? 
And if you married that with your interests, and mine were about politics and society and news, I found that I started to produce pictures in my first year at school, which I could sell to newspapers. So, for instance, in the great blizzard of 19, January 1981, I, I woke up, um, tried to open the front door of our little house that we were renting, couldn't open the door because the snow was nearly four feet high, dug myself out, organised my cameras, put my cameras into plastic bags, went out trudging through the snow, photographing people in the snow, ended up in Newport Station. At that moment, a 125, which was known as the high-speed train, Swansea to London Paddington Express, pulled into the station and broke down because of the, it froze to a standstill basically. And, and all the passengers had to be evacuated and they came trudging through the snow like, you know, it, it was like being in the Arctic. And, uh, and I photographed that um, and I thought, well, you know, what can I do with these pictures now? So there was no way of getting to London. London would be the only place where you could get those pictures published. So I just hung around and hung around and I went back again in the afternoon and I found they cleared the line. And there was a train going to London. So I got on the train, went to London, went straight to the Guardian, said, I've got some pictures of a blizzard, you know, in, in, this, in, 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 this, in, in Wales, in the southwest. And the whole southwest of the country had been cut off. The Guardian ran it across seven columns of the passengers being evacuated from the train. And I got an incredible enjoyment out of that. But just that kind of practical pragmatism, just doing it, learn how to do it. You know, take pictures which have meaning or significance or a news value and someone else will probably want them. Who was the picture editor then? There was a man called Brian Crook. He was a dour man who didn't pay very much money for anything. Did that help later on with the Observer? No, not really, because they, they weren't related then, don't forget. No. Right. I mean, you know, the Observer was owned by Lonro, and the Guardian was owned by the Guardian Trust. That's right, yeah. Um, and the Observer was based in Blackfriars, and the Guardian was uh, in, in Farringdon Road. Uh, my relationship with the Guardian started when I'd taken some pictures of Dickie the Mudlark, um, who was a man who used to, at low tide, um, in Newport, uh, a lot of the dredges used to come up. They used to dredge for shingle and, and, and so on um, in the es es estuary, and they had to berth in, in Newport to be unloaded. But because the river had very steep sides, Someone had to level out the, the bank sides. His job was to climb down, and he was an old man. He was in his late 60s, I would have thought, and wade through this oozing, treacherous, glue-like mud, using a, a, a kind of, well, a flat a, a piece of board on the end of a, a handle. And he used to drag the mud in, and, and flatten it into a, a level area. So when the dredgers, which I think were quite flat-bottomed, came in, as the tide went out, they, they wouldn't topple over. So I took some pictures of this guy, and it, was, it looked in its own way quite dramatic, and I, I sent them in to the Observer. And a, a very nice guy who was an assistant picture editor then called John Hodder contacted me and said he liked the pictures, and he tried to get them into the paper. And um, a few weeks later, he, he called me and said that they were going to be in the Sunday edition. And um, that's that's how I made my contact with the Observer. And it was kind of, let me say this again, um, following that, then I, I had the sort of confidence that I could actually contact them. And I, when I finished at Newport, which was only a two-year course, um, I was in London um, in, the, in the autumn of 1981, and I, I just went to a phone box and phoned the Observer and asked to speak to the picture desk and said, could I come and show them my portfolio? And... It was a Tuesday, and a Tuesday was important in Sunday newspapers because they were never very busy. And as the week went on, they got busier and busier, obviously close to publication date. So you should never call an editor, you know, when they're approaching a deadline. So the guy said, fine, come in. And I saw a guy who's called Tony McGrath. Uh, and he said, are you working today? And I said, you know, am I working today? No. And he said, well, um, would you like to go to Oxford and photograph the guy who compiles the Oxford English Dictionary? For us and I said yeah I would and all I had with me was a Leica and a couple of rolls of Triax no exposure meter and so I set off went to Oxford 
did some portraits of, of the man, came back, and um, they were published in The Observer that weekend across six columns, and that was really how I, my relationship with The Observer started. What were you doing for the rest of the 80s? Were you learning the trade then? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I mean, the break I had so soon after leaving school to work for The Observer was it was really really helpful because I did gradually learn my craft you know and I I, I always want to emphasize that making mistakes and getting things wrong is one of the best things you can do as a photographer because you probably won't ever do it again and so I've always embraced failure it's a, it's a very powerful form of, of of learning and evolving and moving on from where you were before you made those mistakes so it's kind of reflection in action if you like to use a sort of pedagogical term. So I gradually, and, and the, the great thing was when you started to work with, with other photographers who'd been around, a friend of mine, Neil Libert, for instance, you, you used to learn from them. You used to learn from watching them, from watching how they shot things and um, generally how they approached uh, subject matter. But also, very powerfully, the influence of working with knowledgeable, knowledgeable correspondents and foreign correspondents was in its way a great education and a kind of enlightenment. And uh, yeah, so gradually, I think as, as, as the, the picture editor's trust built up in you to always bring something back from an assignment, the assignments I was given got uh, more challenging. They started to involve um, foreign assignments and then gradually um, assignments which involve covering conflict. I think it's learning about the expectations and what's expected of you as well when you're doing stuff like that and in and, and learning the trade and building your confidence but just learning how it's done. I say anybody can take pictures. The difference between being able to take a picture and being able to do it as a job. Yes, the point is about working for newspapers and deadlines. A, you always have to come up with the goods. Exactly. But you usually have to do it in a very short time. You, you don't have the luxury of spending a month to try and get a picture. And you didn't have the luxury then of digital. It was a little bit easier, but as you mentioned before, working with Tranny E6 was just, it was an education in itself. Moving into the late 80s and the 90s, that was a really prolific period for you. An ever changing environment at home, but in the world, there was a lot going on. That period from about the end of the 80s to the end of the 90s was a very significant period in your life for a lot of things, not just for all the awards you won, the, the places you covered, what you witnessed, the transition and the way you thought about things. And you come out of the 90s a different person and a different outlook in photography. Where did the journey begin in the late 80s? I guess it really had to begin with, yes, the the prelude to the Berlin Wall coming down, you know, the end of the collapse of communism in, in 89 and the run-up to that. And uh, as, I, as I gathered more experience and grew confident, more confident in doing things, I became more adventurous, more prepared to undertake difficult assignments, I had a growing belief in the contribution my own work could make in, in terms of broadcasting news and spreading information and asking questions about society, the world, the political events. And I started to look for a broader canvas than just one newspaper. So I was trying to expand the way I worked because I was always a freelance. And I was contacting and working for magazines. I had an involvement with a picture agency. Initially, I worked briefly with Camera Press. Then I worked with network for a short period but then left network and and worked uh, with rex features when stephen mays was the uh, was the editorial director there after that i had a a very enjoyable couple of years working with cats pictures and then i went back to network to cut a long story short and that was about 1990 i was covering the uh, the social upheaval and the revolutions um such as the collapse of the berlin wall you know the velvet revolution in 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 Czechoslovakia and traveling further afield and went off uh, in November, no, I think it was January 1989 to drive across Eastern Europe from Berlin through into Bohemia, photographing the effects of acid rain, pollution, bitumen coal, open cast mining, uranium mining in Ronberg. I'm not sure where I'm going with this, Zach, actually. I, I, I mean, 
I started to win awards. Now, I, I don't think awards are important. They don't actually mean anything. They don't make you a better photographer, and they don't mean that the phone's going to keep ringing. But I suppose they can give you some kind of idea that you're, you, you're doing the right sort of thing. But all through this time, I'm constantly saying to myself, how can I make better pictures? How can I do more important work? Um, what's wrong with the work I've done already? You know, I'm not very satisfied with that. It could have been done in a better way. I should have spent more time. I left too soon. And, and um, at the same time, I I'd started to attract one or two clients um, who were picture editors or art directors on magazines. So I was getting different sorts of assignments than you would have done for a newspaper and being given more time to do them. And I started to enjoy that. And I started to understand the value of rather than in the case of newspaper work, where you're really thinking about one sort of image that tells a story or can illustrate a, a, a piece written by someone that I wanted to build uh, larger photographic essays and reportages. At that stage, I started to um, move away from newspaper work, as I said, although I still kept in touch with them. And, and um, I was working more um, on my own self-assigned bodies of work. I mean, there are many examples but really, I suppose it, 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 it came, it, it culminated in the work I started to do in, in, in the former Yugoslavia, which I spent um, from 1992 until uh, 1999 19, um, working on. When you were travelling around doing the uranium mines and doing stuff, who was paying for that? Well, actually, a lot of the time I was paying for it. <laughs> It worked like this. I mean, you would come up with a story proposal. I was, I can quite emphasize here that it's very, it was very important to have your own ideas or decide that a certain issue was important and persuade an organization or an editor or a newspaper or magazine that it should be covered. Now, quite often, they wouldn't commit to sending you somewhere and paying for all of your expenses, although that happens sometimes. More likely was the fact that editor would say to you, oh, we can give you a guarantee. And a guarantee meant that they would say, give you a thousand pounds. Effectively to see the work when you got back, but without any commitment to publishing it. The great thing about that was that it freed you to approach different publications in different markets. So you might get one guarantee from a British publication but you could also get a guarantee from a French publication, a German publication, an American publication. It's, it's almost, it was almost like a kind of um, fundraising that people do nowadays, you know, through, the, through um, what do they call it, uh, kickstart, something like that. Well, it's not really a retainer. It's just a guarantee against seeing the work. I mean, photography was expensive, as you know, processing, printing. Because in those days, you know, before digital, you'd come back, you'd make an edit, and then the prints had to be printed, and then they had to be distributed. And in the early, earlier days, that was done by sending out small sets of actual physical prints. But latterly, we used to send out black and white slide copies of sets of pictures. You were just running around you with bags of film then? I think people don't realise the cost in purchase of film, getting it developed, the post-production side as well it took a lot of effort and work well you're talking about thousands of pounds always yeah i think i alluded to it earlier i, I mean i've never enjoyed darkroom work although i learned to do it when i was at college and i had to understand the process but i've always i'd always my philosophy was i can earn or learn more by being out making pictures than i can by being in a dark room listening to music for 12 hours making my prints let someone else do that uh, I wouldn't agree with that now so much because I find that one can make better prints using digital technology from your negatives. Uh, a lot of the uh, printers could have made made for you. And I think that's because obviously theirs were commercial operations and they would only allocate so much time to making a print. Perhaps the one exception to that, just from my point of view, was, was working with Mike Spry at Downtown Darkroom. So when you work in somewhere like Bosnia, you went in initially on a commission or did you go in on your own steam? The very first trip I did to Bosnia, I went, um, the observer asked me to go. And that's when, when the, it was in, I think it was in November 1992, and it was when the first um, U, British UN troops 
went in to go up to Vitez in central Bosnia. After that, everything I did was a self-initiated assignment because I didn't want any restrictions. You see, this is the other thing about if someone sends you on an assignment because of the difficulty of things like getting film back, as we had to do in those days, there were limited ways of doing it. You could either bring it back mm. or you could have your own wire outfit, which uh, I never did because it was you needed basically a support team with you or at least the knowledge of how to use leaf fax uh, trans transmitters, but you'd still have to process on location. Mm. There was a third way, which was to give it to someone who was going back who would translate it, mm. transfer it to your organisation, but I've lost too many films that way. It's a scary process, though. Well, it's like you go to an airport, you find someone on a British Airways flight, you go up to him and say, I'm a photographer, da-di-da, -da. You, could you take this package back to London for me? Well... You know, I did that once in the southern Sudan, in Sudan, Khartoum. And, of course, whoever I gave the, the films to just dumped them. On another occasion, uh, I sent films back with um, airline steward from Pakistan. For some reason, they ended up at The Independent. <laughs> um, and actually, The Independent published one of those pictures. Wow. You went on your own back, though. You didn't go, say, with The Guardian. No, I went with The Observer. And it ended up in the Independent. Yeah, I I won't go into how that happened. How was that? How did that go down? It didn't go down well. We'll leave it there. <laughs> Let's leave it there. Yes. I, I think I'm treading on. Yes. Uh, it might be difficult ground to to, yes. to say publicly. If you know, you know. And don't include that bit. Actually, so. Yeah. I'll explain it to you another time. <laughs> I'm looking at your 1994. World Press, first place. Yeah. And you talk about being out on the front line and covering these events and the skill set you have to have as a person and as a, as a craftsman. I'll, I'll use the word craftsman. You were against some heavyweights. There was a lot of good guys out there at the same time. And I'm looking at the World Press, 94, and you've got obviously got Tom, you've got um, John Jones, you've got Natchwe, T Andrew Tester... You've got Eugene. Not Eugene Richards. You've got Eugene. Oh, yeah, you, you've got Eugene Richards, but I don't think he was in, in, in Bosnia. But you've got, um, uh, who's the guy with a hat? <laughs> Larry, um, Larry Tao. Larry Tao. Larry Tao. Yeah, but also don't discount the agency photographers. People like, um, you know, there were the very good agency photographers, Peter De Jong. You've got Luke Delahaye as well. You've got Gary Knight. Yeah. Luke Delahaye. Uh, Keith Bernstein. Alexandra, Alexandra Bula. Pink Kassoff. Yeah, Pink Kassoff. But you also had a stable mate there. Was Mike at Network? I mean, I know he was at Network, but were you at Network then? Which Mike? Goldwater. Uh, he didn't do that much work in, 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 in Bosnia at the beginning. No, he no. but I was talking about at, at Network. Were you at Network then, 94? Yes, I yeah, was. Yeah, so yeah, your yeah, stable yeah, mate. Yeah. I've got a confession to make about that 1994 World Press. I was with Larry Tell doing his edit before he put that edit into the World Press and his pictures were on the table and I kept putting my finger on the picture which one with the kids with a gun in the air and I kept looking at it going, that's brilliant. And... When I saw it, it won, I thought, it's obviously down to me, no, but it wasn't. But I just remember being with him at the time and he was deciding what images he was going to put into World Press and he won it as well. So, But it's interesting, well, I look at Larry Tile's picture and I see a lot of you in that. And I'm not saying that you steal his ideas and he's probably stealing your style. I don't think I knew who he was. Then. Yeah, he was definitely coming through. He wasn't... He was doing a lot of stuff on, was it the Mennonites? Yeah. He did a lot of work in El Salvador before he went to Palestine. Yeah. That, that picture, if I was going to sum a picture up, it's that connection with the people and the lines. It's all, it just reminds me of you a little bit in, in the way you, you shop. I think I used to take pictures. You said there were a lot of heavyweights, but I don't make the same kind of pictures as them. I make pictures of people. One of the things that always used to strike me was that I used to arrive in Sarajevo as everyone else was leaving. And I, I'd meet John Jones, you know, at the airport or something. He'd say, well, why are you coming here? Because I never went for action. I just like to photograph. What's it like to live in a civil war? What's it like to survive in a civil war? 
my one of my big pieces of work from Sarajevo was called Surviving Not Living. I wasn't interested in men with guns, even though obviously men with guns feature in some of the work. I was interested in trying to make pictures that would stand the test of time, which would still have meaning in 20, 25, 30 years' time. Interestingly, I can tell you that the that the picture of the year, which Larry Tao won with that, it was between him and me for that spot, actually. You went back to Berlin as well, didn't you? I was going to say, because, let me finish this. Sorry, mate. Uh, because um, at that point, subsequently, I, I was the chairman of the World Press Judging Committee and, and, uh, and also a jury member in a, earlier. And so I got this kind of inside story, as it were. You went back and looked at Berlin after the Berlin Wall as well, didn't you? I'd always been fascinated by Berlin since when I was a kid and I used to watch the Colonel Pinto. You know, I mean, it was, it was 68. There was, a, you know, it was a dramatic time, 66. I can't remember, was it 68 or 66 when the Berlin Wall went up? And obviously there were those early McCullum pictures. I was always looking for an opportunity to go to Berlin and I got the opportunity to go there and photograph a band called Huey Lewis and the News. Um, and that was in, in 1984. That gave me a taste for Berlin, I, you know, and after I'd done the pictures of the band, I just stayed in Berlin for two or three weeks. I went back several times, for instance, in 1988, I did pictures of, uh, 80, 80, yeah, 88, of, of the Russians leaving uh, Berlin with the cruise missiles. Yeah. I kind of built up a sort of relationship with the city. Then I was there in, in 89, and I think I then decided that I had friends in Berlin, so I used to go a lot. I decided um, to turn what had happened with my work from early work from Berlin, from 84, the events of the Berlin Wall coming down, uh, reunification. In 98, I decided, as it was 10 years after the wall came down, that I'd try and um, make a... I'd walk along the line of the Berlin Wall, effectively, uh, and, and, and build a set of pictures about that 10-year period. The remnants of what was... Yeah, I mean, the interesting thing was when I first went in 1984 and I went across, I went through the checkpoint into East Berlin. I went to the top of the Telly Tower, that image that we're all familiar with, of the, the spike with the large circular, almost like a giant football on the top of it. Is that Alexanderplatz? In Alexanderplatz, yeah. And when you look down from that at night, you could just see how the Berlin Wall snaked around West Berlin. It was a noose. You know, I, I come back to the thing I said earlier at the beginning. If there's something which arouses your interest, if there's something you find you have some sort of passion for or you're intrigued by, you want to explore it, you want to explore it visually, then that's what becomes your motivation. As well as the fact that it may be topical, newsworthy, relevant. You know, it's very important to keep, as a photographer, to be well-informed, to be uh, to educate yourself, to, to read a lot, to read novels. Uh, I was always very disappointed when I was teaching by the lack of reading that so many students did, I must say. Berlin became a book in 99. It became a book, but I'm not, it's not a, I don't know if you want to include this, it became a book and I'm not really happy with it. That's with Motta, isn't it? And you did Bosnia a bit later. I did Bosnia, yeah. I'm much happier with Bosnia. But I mean, as I said to you, I'm probably rarely ever happy with any of my work. <laughs> And I think that's kind of healthy, actually. Otherwise, how do you move on? I realised with Berlin I needed a little more time to do it, but I had a deadline with the publisher. How did you go about getting a book deal then? It was a very different climate then. For, it was very difficult to get books published. Yeah, I think, first of all, you have to have a strong idea. You have to have a strong body of work. And in the case of, of the relationship I had with Motta, that was due to my Italian agent, Grazia Neri, who was rather prodigious agent who, who um, I worked with very, very, very closely in, in the late 90s and, and early 2000s. So she had the contacts with Motta. I had the idea. I'd like to do an anniversary book. She took it to them. They said, yes, we'd like to publish that. It then became a traveling exhibition, certainly around Italy. Um, then again, on the anniversary of the war, having started in, in Yugoslavia in 1992, we took the package to Motra again, and, and uh, they went for that book idea as well, um, which also was a travelling exhibition in, in, in Italy and Europe, and in, in Milan, especially at the very prestigious uh, uh, Sozzani Gallery. You covered a lot of the changing 
political landscape of Britain as well, haven't you really sort of dug in Dutchess Britain? No, actually, well, you know, the thing is with Britain, I, I did. I, I worked from sort of 79 through to 1997. And when Blair was elected, I basically stopped because I thought that's a neat period. And I wanted to move on then and do other things. Really, my last, my last shoot on that was the night at the Festival Hall when Blair and his supporters, New Labour, um, reveled uh, and celebrated their, their victory. And in Downing Street the next day, when, without being too much of a cynic, I would say rent a crowd had turned up to clap the Blairs into Downing Street. There was a transition point then. Within a few years, you were travelling the world with Armani. I think I told you earlier that I decided in 1999 that I would start to look for different things to photograph uh, other than conflict. So photographing things which felt um, the more celebratory, life-enhancing, less gruelling emotionally. The fashion thing came about really quite by chance. Actually, I said that I stopped doing... As part of the, the Thatcher thing, I did actually start photographing some fashion shows because British fashion designers were really quite high profile sort of in the mid end 90s. I started doing sort of backstage. It was the, the, the kind of um, Brit rock, you know, what was it? What was the thing they had where all the Brits turned up at Downing Street, all the fashion designers, and, and there was McQueen and, and McCartney. Um, I mean, cool Britannia, basically, yeah? Yeah. There was a lot of European interest in London design, the arts, Cool Britannia. So I started doing this black and white coverage just as reportage, you know, behind the scenes. And people in Europe, it was being syndicated through Network and our European agents, and people in Europe started to pick up on it and, and publish it quite extensively. And I think the thing was, it was in black and white, and it just, it had that retrospective nostalgic quality, but also amongst the plethora of colour pictures, you know, it stood out. And that's how I got involved with Armani, because the Italians showed that work to Armani, and Armani commissioned me to make a book called Armani Backstage. And that was published in 2000. And subsequently, I, I went on to work with him on his um, journeys to China and Japan, and um, I did a big special at home with Armani in, in, in Milan. And then, of course, what happened then was that I started working for people here on the same sort of themes, such as, you know, I was working for um, GQ and people like that. So it's self-perpetuating in a way. I remember it at the time. I, I thought it was really different. I remember seeing it the first time and I just thought, black and white, photojournalism in the fashion. And the way you did it, I just thought it was groundbreaking. At the time, I was really jealous. Well, I think it was at the time. And, and I think the thing was that I just, you know, everyone else who went to fashion shows stood at the end of the run, you know, the catwalk, the runway, as they would call it, and just shot people, pictures of people in their costumes and their frocks. I wasn't interested in that. I was interested in the culture, the structure, the relationships between people, um, the industry as well, if you like. And, and the spectators and their behaviour. It's all behavioural, you know. I mean, one of the most important books I ever read when I started out in photography was um, was called Man Watching. Elaborate on that, please. <laughs> well, it's a book by, I've forgotten the bloke's name, eh? Desmond Morris, who was an anthropologist. And it's actually a book which is essentially lots and lots of pictures of human beings, illustrating various gestures, body language, movements, spatial relationships to explain or indicate what is the transaction going on between people. And I always use that quite a lot when I was, when I'm photographing people. You know, you observe all the time, you watch. You can see if an argument's going to break out by people's body language changing and the way they, the distances between them. And you prepare yourself to shoot them. You know, I said to my students, use your ears. Your ears are very useful when it comes to working out what's going to happen around you. And they're very useful for picking up stories as well. You can be on the bus and you can hear someone say something in the seat behind you and you think, God, that's interesting. That's worth looking at. That's worth checking out. I can also see that in the way you look at colour landscape work and that abstract, that you're looking for something deeper within the characteristics, the layout of the, the land and the light and what it's trying to offer you. And I've always saw that in your people work myself. I've, I've just saw that early on. 
And I go back to Omani. I, I think that black and white, looking back in hindsight, was a beautiful relationship. I think it had to happen in a sense. It, it's like, why didn't it happen earlier? I don't know. Your China work, I've not seen the China work. Is that colour? No, it's black and white. Wow. I need to check that out. I think there's a little bit on my website, but I'm not exactly sure, to be honest. Your Armani in China, is that is that colour? No, that's black and white. I'm not aware of the full body of work, so um, that's interesting. And I do, would just add that Armani in Japan is in black and white as well. You said something earlier about your, your website and stuff. You're working on that, aren't you? Because Yeah, I am. When I first started looking properly at your website, I know how much of a a vast body of work you have and when I looked at your website I was thinking where's all his work no no listen and I mean that due respect because you have so much to celebrate as a photographer I am really lazy really disorganized very dyslexic and <laughs> and not good with with technology and a bit ADHD and I find it pretty hard to sit down and spend hours putting and, and collating putting up pictures I mean, one of the reasons I've switched from from using the scanners to using the slide copying system is that it's much faster. My wife is always castigating me for not putting pictures on the website. You've got such an amazing history of work, need to celebrate it. Talking of celebration, your No Heroes book, that was an interesting book. It was almost like a sort of transition point of, and a very abstract, in my view, in the terms of the photography, what was in there. But that's like a timeline of your, your work and change in, in transition, isn't it, that book? Yeah, I think, I, th I mean, I made this conscious decision to start shooting much more colour. And I, I really haven't shot any black and white since uh, 2007, eight. Yeah. I didn't really want to photograph people anymore be honest you know there's this thing as a documentary photographer i said to you earlier you have to gain people's trust you have to yeah. go into quite difficult situations where the social circumstances are, are testing and challenging and to get that trust to go on that journey it's quite emotionally exhausting sometimes you know you you go somewhere you hang out you have to hang out with people a long time then you have to deal with it oh, i don't want to be photographed i do want to be photographed don't do this don't take that and then you get to the point where you can start to work freely, but that's often quite a long process. And I wanted to be freed from that, to be honest. I felt I'd, I felt I'd done what I could say. You know, I'd said what I could say. I couldn't see it or do it any differently. And so I went off in this different direction. And I don't know if you've seen that little publication I did called Zeitgeist. Well, I was going to move on to that, actually, because the No Heroes was published in 2003. 2003. Zeitline is... 2017 that's another retrospective as well look i tell you what zach when you're when you're my age everything's a retrospective mate. <laughs> how young do you think i am roger younger than me i'm not younger <laughs> than many people roger yeah and you must give some credit to patrick sutherland with that it's a beautiful book there's a certain imagery within that and that's what i was thinking about zetline it doesn't seem as deep is what No Heroes was in terms of the way you approach the subject. And I might be off balance there a little. What was the narrative in Zetline? What were you trying to say with that compared to No Heroes? I, what I was really trying to say was, um, well, let me start and go back to uh, uh, No Heroes. First of all, some of the subject matter there is so emotive, obviously. Northern Ireland, the miners' strikes, you know, uh, social history, poverty, demonstrations. You know, all things which are still ongoing issues where there's a great deal of social inequity, financial inequity, you know, things that should make everybody angry. I got angry yesterday when I saw that the head of the Deutsche Bank was earning 8 million euros a year. I don't think anybody should earn 8 million euros a year. Anyway, so I think in a way, no heroes had that inherent emotive quality, you know, it's... it's it's powerful work. You know, Patrick and I spent literally days in my apartment at the time with hundreds of workprints laid out all over the floor, just working out how we were going to, going to, um, you know, how we how we were going to sequence it and edit it. It's also beautifully printed, I have to say. The idea with Zeitline was that whatever the subject matter, you you usually see the photographer's characteristics and personality and uh, and, and the way they deal with collecting the world in two dimensions, continuing, even if the work is 
abstract color, as it were. I don't like the word abstract. You can't really apply abstract to photography because abstract is bringing all lots of things together. I say extract. You extract when you take a you take a picture of a black door with a blue spot on it. That's extracting something reality. It's not abstract. And the the, the final picture in in um, Zeitline is a picture which I call Brexit. I don't know if you know that picture. Right. Yeah. It's a, a series of shapes of a piece of graffiti I saw on the wall, and and one of them just looked like Rhys Mogg's eyebrow to me. It was my uh, depiction of Britain falling apart because of Brexit, culture clash, the political clash, and, and the sort of civil war between. And then in the middle of it, there's a thing which looks like a strange parakeet, which is, I think is a sort of chimera, which indicates social disintegration. And I might say it's clearer now than ever that it was the wrong thing to do. Oh, for those who don't know what the Zeitline is, I presume it's German for timeline. Am I right? Yeah, basically moving through time. As a lecturer, as a head of the department, I'm not sure of your title off the top of my head. You were the boss, I guess. Yeah, of documentary photography, yeah. What was your purpose there? What were you trying to say as a photographer, as an educator, as somebody with a lot of history in the business and a lot to say as well? What was the sort of philosophy there with the students? I think my philosophy was to try and explain to them what it could be to be a photographer. Um, Again, I come back and emphasise only be a photographer if you have if there is subject matter that you feel passionately about. I suppose I wanted to give people any opportunity I could to help them fulfill some potential, to to maximise their potential. There are certain pieces of advice, imparted wisdom, that I have always felt were important, that I acquired from people like David Hearn, but also from, uh, you know, simple practical advice that a Daily Mail photographer said to me once, the most important thing is be the first to arrive and the last to leave. That's a really good piece of advice. You know, I've actually left, I left Haiti once a day too early uh, during the, the Haitian Revolution, and I missed a very important element of that story by doing that. So that was a mistake because other people were staying and I thought, I've had enough, I want to get out. I emphasised the importance of research. We did lots of exercises where I was trying to get students to feel confident and um, capable of spending time with strangers. I used to emphasise the importance of continuous experimentation, continuous practice. I found very few students actually practice their craft. One thing that used to, for instance, you know, when I was learning photography, I'd walk around all day looking through my viewfinder and either taking or looking, framing and thinking about making vertical pictures or portrait format pictures. Virtually no young photographers today shoot in that format. And that is something to do with digital and websites and the physical form of digital cameras, I think. Do you think now with digital that we don't acknowledge our mistakes more? Oh, absolutely. I mean, self-criticism and critique. And also, I always used to emphasise to the students, it's, it's good to have a trusted friend that you can edit with. You know, it's a really important thing. You know, you pointed out about Larry Town's picture. You were there editing with him. And that picture's in the set because someone else said, you really should put that in, put that in. Because quite often the photographer doesn't see it themselves. You know, their involvement with the work is too close sometimes. And they might think another picture which had been particularly hard to get is more important being a set than one which actually tells a, a clearer story or a better story, a more powerful story. I've always told students to make mistakes. I've said, accept your mistakes and learn from them and move on from them. Well, a- anything other people do. Yeah. Uh, you know, I said, if you're a chef, you're not a chef just because you buy a saucepan. Yeah. You're not a photographer just because you have a camera. You know, what about all the other aspects of it? I used to like make a lot of um, mind maps when I taught, showing the interrelationship between physical condition, psychology, knowledge, and very much about how to construct a major, major project. And I would always get students to, at the beginning of the year, because I only taught the third years, actually, in their last year. Other people did other aspects of, of the course. Were you writing the curriculum? Uh, yeah, because we did a revalidation when I took over. But I, I, I really have to say it. I don't think I really have huge reservations about whether, you know, a degree, a, de- 
first degree level course is really an appropriate way to learn certainly documentary photography. I think learning through doing many of the photographers, for instance, in network had never done yeah. had any formal education at all. Barry Lewis was uh, a, a physicist. I mean, Salgado didn't do any formal photographic education. It, again, it comes back to this thing, you know, yeah. curiosity, fascination, interest, motivation, eagerness. I mean, trying to explain to students, some students, now, of course, there are exceptions in every group of students. There's always the 10% who are just highly motivated, highly working, get it immediately. And lots of the students that I worked with, had the privilege to work with, have gone on to do really good things in editorial yeah. photography, which I think is great. You can't be a chef because you own a saucepan. You can't be a photographer because you own, you know, you're not a carpenter because you've bought a, a hammer and chisel. Learn your craft. Do your apprenticeship. As you say, make mistakes. Mistakes are great. And I was going to say, that is why I don't didn't like in education the assessment system, you know, putting an A, a B, a C, a D, or a fail on something. I mean, at Newport, there was no marking, just feedback. And the other thing, Newport, which I didn't say earlier on when I was talking about it, you do a shoot, you bring it back, let's say you the classic, you've been out, you photographed the high street watch maker and repairer, you bring it back, you have a crit. The tutor says, well, you could have tried this, you could have tried that, you could have done this better, you could have done better. Go back and do it again. And we used to go back. And you would not be moved on to the next assignment until you had been back maybe two or three times to the same situation and re-photographed it. And through doing that, you learned, one learned, that you've never maximized the opportunity in a situation. Even when you think you have, you can always do it in a, in a different way, a more eloquent way. A different day, different light. Yeah, exactly. Who else was on the course with you there? In my year. The London College. Oh, right, who was teaching with me? Yeah, who was there with you? There were only two of us who were staff. Just towards the end of my time there, was, uh, I recruited a very interesting young academic and um, photographer called Lewis Bush. Very different, Lewis, in his approach. Very, very deconstructing everything exactly he's just deconstructed a digital version of Berger's ways of seeing is it right yeah I've got ways of seeing yeah he's an interesting guy he's so young as well he's very young and he's very bright his approach needs to be married with practical photojournalism or practical documentary as well because not everyone wants to approach photography from an academic point of view do you know what I think it's refreshing to have inputs like that Somebody like Lewis has got a real deep passion to put out stuff. And I think that's important. It, we learn from that as well and gives us different perspectives. Oh, absolutely. I would say very, you yeah. know, I learned a lot. It made me think about things in a different absolutely. way. Absolutely. You know. Who was at Newport with you? Well, actually with me in my year or round about the same time, there was no one in my year who actually went on to do, well, one guy called Jed Murray, who is sadly no longer with us. Around my year, though, there's a guy called Ben Gibson. Right. Paul Lowe was several years after me. Jonathan Ollie, British photographer who works in medium format, who photographed Simon in Norfolk. Afghanistan. Simon Norfolk, yeah. But again, you know, I, I didn't know him when he was at, at college. Well, I mean, the interesting thing was that uh, one of my tutors when I was at uh, Newport was actually Patrick Sutherland. Who, who ran the MA at uh, the LCC in documentary photography but before Paul Lowe took it on. Who's, in your view, the most influential photographer you look up to? Who's that person through your life you've gone, yeah? And who's happening now for you? God, that's a, that's a tough question because I think it changes. Seeing there was a different way of doing things by looking at the work of Cartier yep. Bresson, you know, when I was at college, I was was um, I was interested by you know the Exit Project, um, Mark Edwards actually I think I thought Peter Marlow was a very interesting photographer. Technically, he was brilliant. He had a similar transition to you as well, didn't he? Because he was black and white documentary. Yeah, he 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 was very. I found this thing with some Magnum photographers. He really changed when they joined Magnum actually. I mean, Marlowe, for instance, was uh, he was an agency photographer for Sepa or Sigma, I think. And, and then he went to Magnum and seemed to do nothing but corporate work. 
and then he moved into very abstract sort of square format. Very abstract, yeah. I mean, I, I kind of was interested in Ian Berry when I was a student, just because of the subject matter, and and I think because he was doing a lot of work with New Society, and 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 I went went on to work with New Society. Um, interestingly, although you know, as I say, your, your your ideas change. At the beginning, I found Ralph Gibson interesting, and and I think that was really because of the the uh, and we talked about this earlier, the really powerful graphics that he used in in his work i wasn't so much interested in his content but i i mean just the way he organized shapes in black and white and tonally i thought was fascinating i think literature's had a bigger influence on me than than a lot of photography to be honest is there anybody in the last few years well nowadays i i don't look at much photography because there seems to be so much of it um but i i like um an, an italian photographer called luigi Gheri and Guido Guidi, and, and Eggleston, I think, uh, you know, I've probably seen too much of it, but I think, you know, for the time when he was doing it. What was it about his work you liked? It's very difficult to put your finger on that, because look at Eggleston's work, and whether you, it's a story you make up for yourself as a, as a viewer, or there, there seems to be, you, you go into the picture and you can travel some distance, you know, there seems to be, what's the backstory here, you know, is it a dream, was it? You know, it seems evocative of, it reminds me a bit of sort of like Wim Wenders kind of imagery in his movies. Is it because it's got that sort of cinematic touch to it as well? Well, I think the southern states of America might lend themselves to making, you know, I mean, you can only make pictures of the things in front of you with the colour and with the, I mean, I think, you see, the thing is that Eggleston himself, you know, I, I, I saw an interview with him once when, he was being asked to explain a picture, and he just said to the interviewer, he said, that's the most stupid question anyone's ever asked me. And you just have to look at the pictures and, and let them work for you in the way that they do. And um, you don't do you necessarily have to articulate what it is about them? What is their essence? You know, you could say, you know, T.S. Eliot's poets, poetry is really rather incomprehensible, but, but if it evokes a feeling or an idea... I mean, I think we can never tell. Every viewer sees our picture slightly differently. How would you compare Stephen Shaw, then, to Eccleston? <laughs> well, I mean, look, I, 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 of course I like a lot of Stephen Shaw's work, but... but um, well, we'll leave that one at that, then. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. He's, um, I think he's got lots of very powerful, seminal, yeah. evocative images, but, but he's, he's also produced a lot of stuff which is not especially extraordinary if you know for me as as a looker at pictures you disagree no i'm here i'm just i'm thinking probably as deeply as you are but i'm trying to sort of think of the words i mean it's quite hard when you're talking about this just to bring it when you're not looking at some pictures it's really difficult yeah so what's next for roger hutchins and is apart from sorting your website out and getting your archive together what's next if i can do it I enjoy writing, but I find it extremely difficult. I think I've had a very fortunate, at times difficult, challenging, but set of rich experiences in my life by virtue of being a photographer and many of the stories, assignments and places I've been to. I would like to put this together in a book form. I have the imagery. I need to put the words together and I need to edit it. And I think that would, I would like that to be my retrospective. So that it would be, you know, experiential advice, strong pictures, untold stories, personal experiences, anecdotes, fun, critique of certain behaviours that I've seen photographers involved in, criticism of the industry, etc. So just a reflective that uh, reflection. So that it would, it would be my retrospective look, possibly at my life and at my work. But that's a huge thing to do because I, I'm so, I told you, I'm rather an indolent person and I have to force myself to sit down and do this stuff rather than going into the kitchen and cooking. But I would like to share one last thing with you. Well, one of the things which was great, one of the things I found frustrating when the world went completely digital and, and, and I kind of stopped working for publications was you don't get the same kind of feedback. I mean, not many of us get letters anymore, do we? 
or postcards. We get emails and texts. And people seem to have stopped speaking on the phone as well, which I find completely frustrating. And um, the thing I used to, I used to like, I quite often used to get letters from viewers um, or readers. I, I've had them from readers of The Guardian, The Observer, well, you name it, The Telegraph, magazines, sometimes asking for pictures, often just expressing views about things. I think particularly during Bosnia, people were moved by a lot of the pictures. And I would add about Bosnia that there was one fantastic day when the Dutch, my Dutch agent, Marion Schutz, had managed to persuade every single newspaper in Holland mm. to publish a whole front page of my pictures from Bosnia. So every single newspaper publication, and I have the tear sheets here still, had whole front page pictures. I mean, I'm saying the whole front page. So you imagine the broadsheet telegraph and the whole front page was a picture under someone, you know, hiding, um, crying, hiding, playing chess or whatever. You know, you can't underestimate the power and, and then the, 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 um, the feedback you get from it by saying, well, perhaps this is doing some good. Um, but anyway, you used to get this feedback, and I'll just read you this letter I got after I'd been to photograph the elections in Pakistan when Benazir Bhutto was, was uh, elected. So, dear sir, the photograph of Roger, by Roger Hutchings on the cover of the November the 18th edition of The Guardian was better than any I have ever seen. And I would like to know if it is possible to get copies of the actual photograph, as my brother, at 10 years old, already a callous Philistine, drew a beard on Miss Buto in our only copy. Yours faithfully, Dominic Thompson. What was the date on that? I mean, the, that, was, uh, that was in uh, the 29th of November, 1988. I, uh, you know, you, you'd, you'd sometimes come back and go into the office and we, everyone had a pigeonhole for correspondence and there'd be a few letters in there. It's a beautiful note to leave it on. It was always very affecting when you, you received them. Roger, it's been a pleasure. It's something I've wanted to do for a, a while. I've always wanted to talk to you. I remember meeting you many, many years ago through our, through our mutual friend. We'll mention his name. We've got to mention his in name, Jez Coulson. We have to mention Jez. Everybody should mention Jez at least. Jez, Jez, -er, the world's the world's richest photographer. <laughs> He'll love that bit. He'll probably just record that bit and put it on his ringtone. <laughs> Sorry, Jez. Yes, we met years ago through our mutual friend, the photographer, brilliant photographer, Jez Coulson. And I, it's something I've always wanted to delve into your brain a little bit, and I'm really pleased I've had the chance to do that. And I wish you well, and I hope you get your website together and that's about the fourth time I've mentioned it through this podcast it's been a pleasure Roger well I think you should say Zach that the website is together it just needs um, me to put the rest of my content on it but I'm a little wary of flooding websites with, with too many pictures Dude, flood it Roger flood it please well let me just say thanks thanks for spending the time to talk talk about all these things today and I hope that works out for you Thank you very much. Take care. We are floored, we are bound down. See us, careless corpse, see us, steel dawn. We are storm. We are storm. See us born, see us wind down, see us fly.